I'm uh, Aon Ashraf, um, a managing editor of Coindesk. Uh, I'm here with uh, Chainlink's uh, Sergey uh, Nazarov today. We're going to talk about uh, what Chainlink is, uh, why it matters, and what Chainlink is doing uh, with the TradFi and tokenization, and what's in the future for Chainlink um, going forward. Sergey, thank you so much for um, uh, making the time. Uh, let's, let's start with it. Well, give us a brief overview. What is Chainlink? Sure, my, my pleasure. So Chainlink is uh, the system that originated the centralized oracle networks. And the centralized oracle networks are a computing environment that can come to consensus about everything that blockchains don't come to consensus on. So blockchains come to consensus about private key signatures, token ledgers, and state machines. And that's the universe of things that they can come to um, agreement and consensus on. Oracle networks come to consensus on everything else. Market data, proof of reserves, random numbers for games, automation, more advanced computation, and now most recently cross-chain. And so the Chainlink system in total has processed over eight and a half trillion dollars in transaction value using these uh, Oracle networks to basically process various data that triggers and manages those transactions. And while the Chainlink network began with market data, is expanded very far beyond that to be the largest provider of proof of reserve, identity data, uh, very widely used source of random numbers used by many of the top gaming companies and NFT creators, and now cross-chain. Um, and all of that is underpinned by the same security model, and that security model really focuses on generating validation and consensus on all these other things without a blockchain, right? So you're generating consensus on these computations around data aggregation for market prices, proof of reserves, identity data, random number generation, and now cross-chain bridging, which is very important for both the public chain world and the bank world. Gotcha. So, explain why that is significant for a crypto ecosystem. Sure. So, I mean, there are so many different uh, projects, so many different projects, so many different blockchains that are out there. Why is the Oracle network like yourself is so important? Sure. So, I'll give you an example. Uh, DeFi, centralized finance is considered the next iteration of blockchain technology. But decentralized finance can't exist without oracles and oracle networks. For example, when we started uh, launching Chainlink, the DeFi market was below 100 million. And then with the launch of Chainlink Oracle Networks, it grew to over 200 billion, because what a DeFi application is, is actually that on-chain state generated on a chain which holds the conditions of the financial product. But then it's also an oracle network that at the most basic level feeds things like price data in order to settle and liquidate and, and validate the proper operation of that contract. Now DeFi is actually a collection of Oracle networks connected to a collection of on-chain contracts. Because the DeFi contracts need automation, many of them will soon need identity to take money from different groups um, and, and other things, right? So now what DeFi has become is a collection of smart contracts and the collection of Oracle networks combined into one application. Just like Web2 applications are a connection of different cloud services. So another way to think about it is that blockchains are kind of like an open database and all the APIs and services in the world are Oracle networks. The other thing that um, I think Oracle networks are going to provide now in a secure way is cross-chain connectivity, both for messages and value. And the reason that's important is because the ability to move messages and value across chains basically creates an internet of contracts mm -hmm. where people no longer need to sh choose a single chain. They can actually build their application across multiple chains. And even more importantly, the liquidity and the value in all the chains can be unified into a single network. And that can happen both in public chains and private bank chains. And eventually public and private chains will combine to form a global internet of contracts and that we're using the Oracle network, obviously. So essentially what it is, if I was a TradFi and I wanted to put my bonds uh, um, on a smart contract, I would need to get the price data and, and maybe need to, uh, and then again, you have to settle it with different chains, but that's a long process. So what I would do, I would, if I were using Chainlink, then it, it, I don't even have to integrate with any other chains. I can just directly do my transactions uh, and don't have to worry about all the other complex uh, mechanisms that goes behind it. Right. That's a simple way of putting it, but I'm just saying, is, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's largely correct. Um, I think for TradFi, there's largely three stages. Mm -hmm. 
So stage number one is creating a tokenized asset on chain. Mm -hmm. um, let's take something like a gold coin and through our proof of reserves um, system in Chainlink, we power the vast majority of, of the gold coins that prove anything about themselves. Um, so you made a gold coin, but you need to prove that the gold is there. So you made a gold coin on your own chain, you've proven that the gold in the vault exists, maybe you've proven some other things about the quality of the gold provi vault provider or some other properties of the coin. But now you want that coin or that real world asset or in the TradFi world it would be called a digital asset to be purchasable or purchased by counterparties. Okay, well if those counterparties are not connected to your chain where you put out that real world asset or digital asset, well then your market is non-existent, right? So your second problem is now I need to get connected to all these other chains, whether they're public chains or private chains, where the liquidity can purchase my asset where the market is. Okay, so now you've made the asset, you've connected to the chains, someone else has purchased the real world asset, the digital asset from your chain, and it's been moved over CCIP, the cross-chain interoperability protocol, which is now getting very widely adopted both in the public chain world and also in the bank world. You've moved it to their chain, but now the asset is somewhere else and it still needs to be updated with the status of the gold. So now the proof of reserve system can flow that information and data over CCIP to the asset so that even if the asset goes to a third chain, blockchain C, like a, let's say it's a chain of a custodian, then the asset continues to be updated. So it's not just about creating the asset and making it reliable and de-risked by adding proof of reserves. It's also not about just moving it and selling it to another chain. It's about those two things and keeping the asset updated. Right. And then the fourth equally important thing is that you should be able to do all of that without ever going to the chain where the asset ends up. Mm -hmm. So in today's world, you have this really weird experience with bridges where you have to take a wallet, you have to put the wallet assets out of the wallet and into the bridge, right. you have to use the bridge, then you have to go make a wallet on the chain that you sent the value to. You have to take the assets out of the bridge, put it in the second wallet you now have on the second chain. That's kind of a nightmare experience. Right. Yeah. What CCIP allows you to do is it allows you to attach messages to the value so that you can just say from one place, you know, I want to send the stable coin over to this chain mm -hmm. and I want it to go to this contract mm -hmm. and I want it to use this function. Mm -hmm. So let's go to blockchain X to contract Y, use function Z. Right. For example, the buy function. Mm -hmm. I want to buy this much of a carbon credit asset mm -hmm. and then send it back to me at this address. So in addition to, to all of these things of creating a reliable asset, moving the asset, and keeping the asset updated so it remains what's called a golden record or a uh, single source of truth, you can also now do this in a very efficient way where you don't actually need to integrate or go to the second chain. You can just kind of say, hey, I want to send the stable coin here, I want to get the asset, I want to send it back. Right. Um, and this, I think, will greatly improve the efficiency and user experience and reduce the overhead that people need to use any chain because they can use it from where they are, they can stay there, and they can use hundreds of different chains right. without going and integrating with them. Of course, they can, they can send the value and the message at the same right. time, so right. it makes it more efficient. Speaking of efficiency, um, you, the, tra how, how, the TradFi, they need the efficiency to properly operate uh, their business. So how are you helping TradFi? So you had quite a few uh, uh, announcements from the TradFi world that you have partners with, partnered with them. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, so I would, I would say there's um, you know, three big categories of things. The first one, the stuff that we've worked on with Swift and continue to work on with them, is the ability to connect to hundreds of chains from your existing infrastructure. So the thing that really separates banks from a lot of startups and other, even other mid-sized technology companies is that they were formed 40, 50 years ago and they have all this existing infrastructure and all these existing systems that they're not going to get rid of. Right. And they have all of these people trained on how to use those systems and those systems are actually secure and, and used to hold value. It's actually from those systems that they're going to want to transact with blockchains. So the first thing was working uh, with Swift to make it so that Swift messages, which is a very commonly used standard for banks to communicate with each other and internally among their own systems, for those Swift messages to be used to trigger transactions on various chains. Right. So now integrating into uh, hundreds of chains is no longer about integrating into hundreds of chains, it's about integrating into Chainlink with one integration, and that one integration gives you access to those hundreds of chains. Mm -hmm. And this removes the friction and creates efficiency and makes it much easier for blockchains to become 
part of the infrastructure that banks use, right. which means that the value that they have can flow onto chains much more easily. That's the first thing. The second thing is the ability to connect multiple different chains mm -hmm. into an internet of contract, into a network of chains, so that the liquidity and the value in those chains can flow to any one financial product in that network. Mm -hmm. So that means you can launch a real world asset token on blockchain A, and then blockchain Z, that's also on CCIP, can purchase it. Mm -hmm. And the more chains that are in this network, the more value, the more market size, the more liquidity there is. So that second one is a very important one because the banks are going to make these assets to make them widely and easily accessible. Right. And then the final one is actually making better assets. So you can now make uh, tokenized real world assets where you have the input of proof of reserves, mm -hmm. you can attach identity from an identity oracle network, mm -hmm. you can attach price from a price network, and all of that creates uh, a golden record or what's often known as a single source of truth mm -hmm. that's updated second by second. Right. And so anybody who owns that asset knows exactly what's going on with their single fractional share of value. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go and ask somebody, they don't have to go and figure out. They know at every moment that there's gold backing this asset and the gold is worth this much and there's identity data attached to the asset so it's legally okay for them to get that asset. Mm -hmm. And this um, kind of de-risking of assets by adding more and more information into them is really what the global financial in industry and their infrastructure has been missing, and that's what I hear consistently. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, there's all this opportunity in terms of connecting to other chains and getting assets to be used by uh, other banks and purchased by them. And then on the other hand, you have all of these efficiencies mm -hmm. that um, massively reduce the costs and very importantly, reduce the risk. Because the goal of the people here is, yes, it's to open up new markets and have more opportunity, but it's to do it in a risk-adjusted way that their risk is managed down. Because their favorite thing is not just crazy returns, it's returns that are de-risked. Mm -hmm. That's actually the, the business that these banks are in. Right, that, made, that makes sense. <clears throat> and speaking of that risk, um, can you talk a little bit about how the risk management works for CCIP? And um, because obviously, any, any, any kind of risk in this kind of world, in this world, is 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 not acceptable for TradFi's. So, can you talk about how uh, for a big of an uh, important part of that uh, is, of CCIP, the risk management part of it? Sure. So, CCIP took us over three years to build, has undergone multiple security audits. And what it really is, is um, multiple Oracle networks working together to create a secure and reliable bridge where those Oracle networks are checking key aspects of the security and reliability and risk management. So really, uh, every CCIP bridge can be divided into two key sections. One is the core transactional bridge, which is what's known in infrastructure as a thin pipe. So it's a very efficient, high throughput place where the transactions can move and they can move at high speed and very efficiently. Then you'll have the risk management network, which is a much more advanced um, network that approves or denies transactions without ever actually touching the tokens. Mm -hmm. And that network is where you encode all kinds of risk policies and risk conditions and so on. If you look at every system in the world that transmits value, credit cards, payment networks, bank systems, they all have risk management departments, risk management systems, risk management software, and that's because if you don't have a way to manage the risk of transfers, you will end up either taking risk, injecting very large cost, or having extremely low speed. Mm -hmm. So the dynamic with value transfer across the internet has been the people who can manage risk well can achieve higher speed at lower cost with less risk. Mm -hmm. And so CCIP is the only uh, bridging system that has this notion of risk built in, in a way that is configurable and that you can add different parameters of risk. And that's actually a lot of what, what banks uh, do, is they have all kinds of systems that they analyze you know, a positive outcome, but they also manage the risk. So you're saying that it's at the risk, the par parameters for the risk management is customizable? Completely configurable. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, the whole Chainlink framework is made to make completely configurable Oracle networks composed of whatever collection of nodes the developer feels are best for them and their security needs with whatever, in the case of CCIP, with whatever risk policy and risk management practices that they feel are the best to guarantee the security of their transactions. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason that's very important is that A, we don't know all the risks right. that, that are yet to unfold in relation to the transfer of value across chains. And so it's very good to have a flexible system that can incorporate those risks as they appear, which is, by the way, how all value transfer systems work that manage risk. They always have 
very robust ways to add more risk management. Eventually, I think the risk management network will even incorporate elements of AI and all kinds of advanced analysis. And then the second thing that I think is also important is the ability for uh, the system to be easily and quickly integrated mm -hmm. into all the places where the people using it want to get transactions from. Mm. And so CCIPs think, I think on the bank level is, is very far ahead on that side based on all the banks we're working with, mm -hmm. as well as the CSDs like DTCC, Euroclear, and, and various others that we're in conversations with. Right. So I, I think we are kind of in a place where you have these two parallel worlds, you have the public chain world, and then you have the bank chain world. Mm -hmm. And while these worlds are kind of separated by um, a lack of legal clarity, once they both run on CCIP, and once that legal clarity appears and that, that wall goes down, they will all transact with each other on the basis of using the same connectivity layer and on the basis of the ability to define their risk mm -hmm. as they transact with each other. Fascinating. Uh, let's, let's switch gear a little bit. Uh, let's talk about uh, your competitors and your market shares. So in terms of TVS, total value secured, and in, on an enterprise basis, you guys have the largest market shares. Why is that and what are you doing to stay ahead of your comp competitions? I, I think the fundamental answer is security. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, com the competing systems, many of them are really quite centralized, mm -hmm. running on one or two servers. Um, and then there are other systems that have something like 20 servers, but then it turns out one person has the keys, like uh, multi-chain as an example. So I think the centralization and the lack of real reliability and security, and uh, the way that these systems are architected just makes it obvious that they're not made to be reliable or secure. Um, in many cases, because the people architecting them never built a system like this. Um, we have a very large community of security experts and researchers. Um, at Chainlink Labs, there are hundreds of, hundreds of people working on helping improve the security of the system as well. We have top um, academics and researchers working constantly on verifying the security, and there's millions of dollars spent on the security audits of every aspect of the Chainlink system, whether that's the data side or whether it's the cross-chain side. And so I think the fundamental um, value of security in our industry is never to be underestimated. And Chainlink as a framework successfully uses decentralization to create real security, which is proven by the fact that it's securely and reliably processed over $8.5 trillion worth of transaction value. Uh, what, what time frame is that? That, we only started counting, that, that's only counting from the beginning of 2022. Oh, wow. So that's, an, that's for less than two years. Mm -hmm. But the system has been live on production without any significant issues for over four years. Right. And the, the second reason is reliability. Mm -hmm. So the first one is security and immune, and the, to the immunity of, of loss. And then the, the second one, is reliability. So for example, when Ethereum gas went to over 2,500, many systems stopped working. The majority of systems stopped working. But chain link networks continued to update without missing updates. And so on the one hand is security, on the other hand it's liveness and reliability. And then the, the third side of the equation I would say is really the quality of the connection. Uh, what are you connected to? So the data quality of the chain link network really can't be surpassed in terms of any of the data that you can get for identity, price, proof of reserves, or anything else. Mm -hmm. So the actual inputs into the Chainlink system are the highest cost, highest quality inputs that you can get right now for DeFi and all these systems. Many of the other ones are easy to manipulate, they're cheap, or they're actually built in a way that they're meant to manipulate the application that uses them to extract value from that application, which is a very weird, a predatory model I'm starting to see emerge. And then on the cross-chain side, the ability to securely and reliably connect to the right places is something that Chainlink and CCIP are continuing to get more and more of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on the bank side, we'll have by far more than anyone else. And we're doing that once again in a way that maintains the security and reliability of the system. Okay. How, and how are you doing that? So it's really how the protocol is built. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So on the data side, when FTX happened, there was a multitude of data providers that were heavily weighted towards FTX. And the Chainlink system removed those data providers mm -hmm. and replaced them with reliable data providers that weren't heavily weighted toward FTX. And that's an example of risk management. And that's something that the system kind of did and, and was architected to do. And that's something that you know, the people running the system, the nodes and everyone was involved in. On the cross-chain side, we have the risk management network, and no one else has any real notion or module for risk management, the whole bridging system, which, which should kind of tell you 
how little real principled security design has gone into those things. So I think you can't really add security later. You have to do what's called principled systems design. And for example, another consequence of our principal system design, uh, flash loan attacks. So this, the, the Chainlink system on the data side completely avoided using TWAP and basically the, the DEX prices that are very easy to manipulate. And there were a number of people that didn't necessarily believe us and we're talking about how TWAP's great and it's fine. And then guess what? Those people got flash loan attacked mm -hmm. because they're, they're, that's not a principled systems design decision. Right. Um, and the reason that Chainlink has resisted all of these flash loan attacks is because it was designed in a way to resist them, not when they started happening, but before they started happening. Mm. So it's, it's not about adding security later, it's about making sure that security is built in from the beginning, right. and then going through a rigorous review process, an auditing process with multiple auditors, and actually spending millions of dollars on that, which um, many people are unwilling or unable to do. Right, being proactive is always better than re being reactive. Right. 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 Uh, let's uh, get more of a broader picture. Um, What's your view on the tokenization? The real, uh, th there has been a big push from the TradFi, the banks coming in and they're tokenizing their uh, real world assets. What's your view on that? Do you think this is the future? I think, I think it's going to be a very active market for banks. Mm -hmm. I think they're good at doing this because they have access to all the world's real world assets right. and real world asset holders come to them to turn them into financial products already. Mm -hmm. So I think they're very well positioned to generate many real world assets and I think they see a big market for that. I'm seeing a lot of stuff in carbon credits, some fund tokenization, some real estate, and other things. I think initially they're going to transact with each other because they know each other as counterparties and they feel comfortable legally doing that. I personally believe that eventually the biggest market for real world asset from banks will actually be public blockchain protocols because the public blockchain protocols need diversified collateral. This is something they desperately need to avoid ending up like Terra, basically, because they don't want to be heavily overweighted towards crypto-only collateral, because when there's the cyclical bust of crypto, the cyclical bust results in like, you know, orders of magnitude greater problems than if you were diversified even to 30% of your protocol's collateral. And they, I think, the public blockchain uh, protocols are the ones that will be willing to pay the biggest premium for this diversified collateral. There is just, once again, this wall, this legal wall between the public chains and the private bank chain world. We are um, supporting both of those worlds through proof of reserves, data, identity, various types of computations, and, and, and cross-chain being built out in each of those separate ecosystems. And then I do very strongly believe that the yield from the public blockchain world will be very attractive to banks, and they will put their clients' money into the yield generated by public chains and then the public chains will greatly benefit from the assets that the banks tokenize and put into their protocols, making those protocols more resilient and reliable. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a relationship that just doesn't exist because people don't see it like happening. Mm -hmm. But if, to me, it's very obvious that the economic interests of these groups and their financial benefit to each other can be aligned. Mm -hmm. And we're building the technology and the rails and the systems that will allow them to align mm -hmm. in a very informed and risk managed way so that everyone can look at the data backing the assets, everyone can move the assets, and even as the assets move, they'll continue to remain updated and reliable. Makes sense. Uh, in, in terms of all the conversations that you're having with these banks, is this somewhere, somewhere where they're heading towards? I mean, I, I don't think they're heading towards. I think some of them are there. They're already there. Like we announced some stuff with uh, ANZ, one of the largest banks in Australia with over a trillion dollars in assets under management, where basically, Using CCIP, there was a transfer of a stable coin from one chain, their stable coin that they made, from one chain to another chain in exchange for a reef credit, which is a type of green asset, carbon credit type of asset, that was then moved back to the originating chain that paid for it with a stable coin. And that's something we were able to make work with the help of CCIP and, and various other technologies from, from the Chainlink framework. So, I was just a test project. Yeah, that, that, that was on testnet, right. but I'm seeing these things move forward. Right. So I've, I've never seen a few things. I've never seen people with digital assets in their title. Mm -hmm. So there's entire teams of people now in the banking world that are focused on digital assets as their full-time and only job. Mm -hmm. It's not in like the innovation group. Right. And now I am seeing them go to production and be able to conduct, conduct transactions with each other um, also because there's a little bit of more legal clarity. Mm -hmm. Like in Europe, for example, there's the pilot regime for tokenization that came out in March. 
And then in other places, there's some amount of legal clarity that allows them to transact on a secondary market basis. Right. And so I, I am seeing them go to production. Um, and you know, I think we're going to be pretty involved in that. Makes sense, yeah. Um, you, you touched a little bit about the regulatory cl uh, clarity. Um, given what's going on in the world right now, with uh, you know what's going on in the U.S., um, what's your view going forward? How does the crypto world move forward? I, I think there's a fundamental truth about the crypto world that it's good for society. Mm. And I think all of these governmental systems and frameworks, they want to protect society from bad things and they want to encourage good things. So I, I think the truth of, of the matter and the truth of the situation is on the side of blockchains, mm -hmm. similarly to how it was on the side of the internet. And when the internet appeared, there was a lot of weird activity on the internet. People did weird things. There were new situations that the technology allowed to happen that previously were not, under, you know, didn't exist. And it was kind of like a little freaky, but what uh, the US did and what other people did is they were permissive about what you could do on the internet mm -hmm. and they allowed people to transact and they allowed people to build valuable applications and now we're all on the internet, mm -hmm. right? People will be watching this over the internet, we communicate over the internet, we consume media and content from the internet, um, the internet gives us transportation through that, things like Uber. So I think at the end of the day, the net benefit of blockchains is so massive that even if there are some negative consequences, just like there are with the internet, um, that all of these um, governmental structures, regulatory structures, will see the value of blockchains mm -hmm. and they will implement them and guide them into a way that's useful for society. So I, I think the first thing is that the, the truth and the value of the system is, is very much, the truth of the value is there. It's absolutely there. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no doubt about that, and so it's all going to end up fine for that simple, basic reason, that, that this is beneficial to society. Um, there will be ups and downs. You know, the, the, the industry is very cyclical. I've been in the blockchain industry since 2010, right. back when it was coined the, called the Bitcoin industry, because right. Bitcoin was the only blockchain at that time. And I've seen it go through many cycles, and the cycles are always the same. You know, everything booms, people make money, everything grows. And then the system can't handle that much money, can't handle that much value. And then somehow it breaks, and then someone loses money, and then you know, cyclically things go down. But every time the boom comes back, right? Because the value of the technology is there and what it, what it allows. And so I think now we're just in a place where we, we kind of reached the pinnacle and a height of the industry that wasn't previously reached. And things didn't work out, you know, a bunch of things broke. We learned a bunch of ways that things shouldn't be working. Now those things are hard lessons everyone's learned. We fixed the system or the system's in the process of getting fixed. And so next time it'll be able to handle more value. Um, but, but that's what I think all of this stuff is a reaction to is something didn't go right. right. Something didn't go right doesn't mean that the fundamental value of something isn't there. Um, when you make new things, where you push the limits of what's possible, when you invent new ways of doing things, you naturally discover ways that they're not supposed to work. Right. And you know that's just not something that everyone's always used to. Mm -hmm. I'm used to it because you know in, in building new technologies, you you, right. you see that on a right. you know on a common basis on various technologies. But I think it just takes people a little bit longer to kind of step away from whatever happened that was wrong, mm -hmm. and to get back to realizing the fundamental value of what's going on. Right. But but the very important thing is that the truth is on on our side because the value is there, and it's there for the individual. It's there for the government, it's there for society, mm -hmm. it's there for the banking industry, it's, it's there for everybody. Right. So I, I think at the end of the day, that is what has always dri driven the very large adoption of every technology. Even if initially there were all kinds of risks and problems. For, for example, with cars, in the early days of cars, there were laws that said that before a car was able to enter the city limits, someone had to walk in front of the car and wave two red flags right. and announce to the town that a car was right. entering the, the, the town limits because the car was classified as an explosive device because it has it was using explosions right. to power the engine yep. right or was using explosive fuel and you know now we all drive around in cars mm -hmm. right so I, I think it's it's just that recurring pattern with technology that we're seeing a, a version of now makes sense if you were to compare um, the you know the early days of internet versus uh, crypto where would you say we are I can't tell if we're pre-2000 or post-2000. Hmm. I can't tell if, 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 if uh, the hype cycle has reached a kind of peak or not. Right. Um, I don't think it has. 
because the vast majority of the world's value has still not gone onto a blockchain. So I would say that we're pre-2000 okay. in that analogy. Um, I also think from an infrastructure level, a lot of the infrastructure isn't fully built out mm -hmm. um, or even at a basic level. And that infrastructure is also, I would say, in the pre-2000 stage. Mm -hmm. I think the infrastructure will grow. I think it'll be able to handle more value, more speed. Um, you know, the risk will be managed you know, better with the help of proof of reserve and other technologies. Then I think the industry could, could easily boom well past one trillion into the double digit trillions. Mm -hmm. So the 10, 20 or 30 or more trillion dollar uh, total market cap range. And then we will see if the system can reliably manage that. Right. We can see if blockchains can reliably hold and secure and be responsible for that much value. And if they can, then you know, the system will continue to grow, and if they can't, then we'll have another cyclical, cyclical boom and right. bust cycle. Right. But I, I think we're, we're still, in the internet analogy, we're still in the pre-2000 stage of, of this industry. Fair. So what's next for Chainlink? I think what's, what's next from, you know, on the trajectory that we're on is continuing to process uh, trillions of dollars in transactional value, right. injecting the most amount of reliable validated data into both DeFi public chain applications, blockchain games, insurance, NFTs, and now the, the banking industry. Um, I think a big focus is going to be on cross-chain and CCIP right. and creating this internet of contracts in public chains and this internet of contracts in private bank chains in anticipation of both of those internet of contracts merging into one big global internet of contracts, similarly to how TCP IP created the internet. We're working um, pretty much day and night to see how CCIP can generate a global internet of contracts where all the chains are connected. And then once um, you have a way to inject all the information, do all the compute, and provide all the value across chains in a seamless, efficient way, I think you get to a next level of applications. Right. And similarly to how Uber and Netflix and those applications define the internet for most people, because the infrastructure got to the level that it could enable those applications to exist, I think we are now kind of in the stage where the infrastructure that made something like Netflix and Uber possible is being built right now by us. Right. And then as it gets built and as it reaches those scales and, and scalability and security needs of, of that quality of application, we will see another crop of applications that are you know, at the level of, that they're like the Uber, Netflix equivalent right. of, of the blockchain industry. Right. And then those applications will drive the mainstream adoption of the industry, both from the retail basic consumer side and from the private bank side. Mm -hmm. And then eventually both of those worlds will once again merge to become a single global internet of contracts. Right, makes sense. And speaking of the banks, uh, do you have any partnerships that are you working on that you can share with us? I have more partnerships than, than, than I can count at this point. We're, we're actually going to, after this conference uh, here, we're going to take a tally of the amount of, amount of people that we're going to be working with on various different POCs and pilots and going to pro on, towards production with some people. Um, I think the amount of demand is, is quite large mm -hmm. because banks, you know, they have the resources, they have the team members, and they have the market that wants these real world assets from them. And, and now the question is really twofold, how do you technically enable all that to happen through CCIP and proof of reserves and identity data and all these other kinds of key inputs? And the second question is, how does the legal framework that banks are so de de dependent on allow and enable and accelerate that? Mm -hmm. And what, what we're going to be doing is getting set up in a technical sense to help facilitate all those transactions. And then as the legal clarity comes, the amount of uh, adoption, I think, will skyrocket because that's the only thing that I really see holding uh, banks back. It's right. not the market opportunity, it's the lack of clarity on how to scale the market opportunity into the size that they want. And it's partly the lack of um, technical rails and systems that can do that efficiently. Right. So we're going to solve the technical rails efficiency problem, and then the legal problem will gradually get solved, and then we'll kind of hit an inflection point where the amount of throughput, I think, will, will, will go through the roof, in, in, in my opinion. <laughs>